Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I trust you have all had a good lunch. Now you can have a nap. In this presentation, I will review the Iraqi Jewish education from its history in the Ottoman Empire and examine its development and impact on the Iraqi society during the period of 1920 to 1950. The Jews adopted a system very similar to Muslim education, instructed by the mullah and known as katatib, where students learned to read the Quran and write in Arabic. The Jewish pupils studied reading Hebrew and learning prayers generally taught by a teacher in a room in his house. It was very elementary education. This was called the header, where the children read and wrote Hebrew using Judeo-Arabic script. The Midrash school was subsequently created based on formal classes in a large building providing more advanced instructions in Hebrew and Arabic with some primary education. It also taught Jewish religion, Jewish history, and Jewish law. This continued in, existing, in existence, although gradually diminishing and expiring by the 1930s. The best students of the Midrash were selected to attend the yeshiva to study and become rabbis. These were boarding schools with total religious dedication. The Ottoman Empire was gradually diminish diminishing in its power and became known as the sick man of Europe. In accordance with the foreign privileges granted by the empire in favor of the Christians, the European states could open some schools for the Christian population in the Ottoman Empire. On that basis, several missionary schools were established, and missionaries were sent to several parts of the Ottoman Empire. Although these schools had a religious bias, they contributed towards better education with some foreign languages, mathematics, and primary education. It is on the back of these initiatives that Societe Alliance Israelite Universal was established in Paris, seizing the opportunity of improving the education of the Jewish people in the Ottoman Empire and the rest of the world. It was hoped that the Western style of education promoted by the Alliance Society would westernize the minds of the Jewish community and afford them better living, fully integrating with the society, and not suffering from the aspects of anti-Semitism prevalent in some parts of the empire. For this to be successful, it required the teaching to be secular, along Western lines, and with broad cultural basis, for which purpose they opened schools in the Ottoman Empire. The first school opened in Istanbul in 1862, same time Tunis, and gradually spread to North, North Africa, Middle East, and rest of the world in the next 50 years. The Iraqi community, backed by the Sassoons and the Daniels, wrote to the Alliance requesting assistance in establishing a school teaching secular subjects. In 1864, the Leon School was established in Baghdad, but not before a great resistance by the religious authorities, to the extent that the students were threatened with excommunication, and the school was closed. The community elite and liberals persisted in their attempts to modernize the community. 
Eventually, after much deliberations about secularity, modernity, religion, and law, the secular modernists won. Thank God. And, and the Alliance opened in 1865 in Baghdad. The Alliance School of Instruction was French and Arabic, though English, Hebrew, and Turkish languages were also taught, but to a lesser extent. Later in the 19th century, it began to offer classes in math, history, geography, physics, biology, chemistry, etc. Students graduated with a French brevet certificate and were accepted into Turkish universities. The Alliance may contain primary and intermediate education, whereas the rest of the schools in, here, in the country during the 19th century were at best in primary education. In fact, there was only one school that was opened by Madhat Pasha that which was for the military, which had secondary, intermediate, and secondary education. The Alliance brought in qualified teachers from France to teach French and science subjects. It didn't take very long for the Alliance to start schooling for girls. And you can imagine even more voluble attacks from the religious authorities. But again, the liberals won. And in 1893, a girls' school was opened, which met with a huge success. The society in France continued to support the school, financially assisted by the Baghdadi Jews of India, the Sassoons and the Kaduris and the Hadoons. But gradually, the local Jewish community started making larger contributions. And the Alliance, at the beginning of the 20th century, now stretched its educational mission into other parts of the country. But they were all primary schools, except Baghdad and Basra. Baghdad and Basra had uh, intermediate schools. The Alliance prided itself in not being just an academic establishment, but a cultural institution. And so students were involved in sporting activities, boy scouts, football, tennis, acting, music, all sorts of things. The latter half of the 19th century brought about a lot of changes to the Iraqi Jewish society. In addition to the opening of the Alliance, the dimmy status of the Jews under the Ottoman Empire diminished. The jizya tax was abolished, and the anti-Jewish feelings were receding. Baghdad, being the center of trade between Europe and Asia, extended this realm to Basra. So Basra became a very important place when the Suez Canal was opened, with benefits to Iraqi Jews and their connections in India. The Jewish community was pleased with the education of its students, naturally, and realized that education is a very useful attribute for the future, especially with the occupation of the British and the expiry of the Ottoman Empire. They guessed that there was an opportunity that can be best exploited by having better education and knowledge of foreign languages, mathematics, science, and accounting. The community went into a program of opening more schools, especially in Baghdad, eventually even taking over the administration of the schools from the Alliance Society of France. The number of schools kept on increasing, and one of the most important schools opened was Shamash School, established by the Anglo-Jewish Association in 1928, with more concentration than the Alliance on the English language. And with a secondary school, there weren't many secondary schools, this was a secondary school that taught to English matriculation exam level, which was the entry requirement for British universities. 
Shamash School was very influential, as many graduates of the schools proceeded to higher education at home and abroad. Shamash School came to be known as a school of academic excellence. By 1920, there were 12 Jewish schools in Iraq, six of which were in Baghdad. The figures increased to 26 by 1950 in Baghdad, with specialist evening schools. In fact, out of these 26, 10 schools were opened in the 1940s, between 1940 and 1950, in the last 10 years. Uh, the number of students in Baghdad increased from 5,500 in 1920 to 10,400 in 1950. In 1950, just to give you some figures, boring as it may be, 19,000 Jewish students attended schools in Iraq. 3,500 attending secondary schools or high schools. Community figures showed that only 44% of the students paid the school fees, the rest was paid by the community. That was the level of commitment of the um, Jewish community. There was an underdeveloped education system in Iraq during the 1920s, and there was the need for instructors to teach Western languages. But the Jewish schools were well advanced, importing teachers for quite some time, some decades, in fact. The Ministry of Education tried to emulate the Jewish system and imported several Palestinian and Syrian teachers to supplement the teachers being bred and trained in Iraq. Foreign schools, like the American Jesuit school, known as Baghdad College, was opened in 1932 with a system of teaching analogous to Shamash school. The quest for education pioneered by the Jewish community became quite infectious, leading to many people in Iraq attending schooling in terms of both males and females, as the state campaigned against illiteracy. Colleges for higher education were opened, like the College of Medicine, 1927, Pharmacy, 1932, in addition to the law school, first opened as a school in 1908. A teacher's training college opened in 1923, proved to be very popular. Iraqi Jews were enthusiastic in pursuing higher education. In the first set of graduates from the medical college in 1931-32, I think that was referred to earlier, there were 20 doctors, of whom eight were Jewish. The first state scholarship was given to Jack Budishabi in 1932. In 1934, there were 19 graduates, of whom 11 were Jewish. From the pharmacy college, there were 17 graduates in 1935, eight of whom were Jewish. Bear in mind that the percentage of the Jews in Iraq may have been something like 3% at the time, maybe even less. So that's quite a high proportion. 977 Jewish students complete their higher education in, in 1920 to 1950. 77% graduated in Iraq and 23% in foreign universities. These figures prove how the Iraqi Jews excelled in their education. Many Jews gained positions in the new bureaucracy, such as the Ministry of Treasury, legal affairs, public works, thanks to their Western education. It is evident that the knowledge in English language helped the Jews to acquire administrative positions and that they were given administrative posts 
in various government ministries. Also, and the railways, Iraq oil company, oil refinery, shipping, airports, insurance services, banking, export, import services, telegram and post, etc. In basic terms, a middle class society was created to facilitate the working of the Iraqi government during the British mandate and beyond. We therefore has, have a community that has contributed a great deal to the building of modern Iraq. In fact, Miss Bell foresaw the influence of the Jewish community and further promoted their participation. The Jews in Iraq contributed to all walks of life, culture, health, business, commerce. I will not indulge uh, to enumerate them all, but I will, however, emphasize as the one, as the most distinct matters of distinction, banking, commerce, as most banks were either owned or administered by Jews. And most imports were brokered by Iraqi Jews. The Baghdad Chamber of Commerce in 1935 consisted of nine Jews, four Muslims, two British. Music whew, oh, was totally dominated by Jewish artists in terms of both musicians and composers, like the Kuwaiti brothers. In the 1920s, the Jews were well integrated within the Iraqi society. Everything was going swimmingly well. In the middle of the 1930s, certain cracks began to appear, particularly after the death of King Faisal I, with evidence of discrimination. Certainly one that will remember in 1933, all in, in the public works department, there were plenty of Jews there and they were all sacked for no reason other than they were Jewish. And they were replaced by Arshad al -Amari. Um By 1940s, you know, these cracks widened into splits. And with the establishment of the State of Israel, eventually resulted in the mass exodus of 1950-51. The reasons behind this is too complex for this talk. I know we were talking yesterday, that was oversimplification. This subject is really too complex and would require quite a long time to discuss. But one could not help notice the vociferous campaigns led by the right-wing newspapers against the Jews of Iraq. And the, these campaigns resonated with the populace and later resulted in the loss of citizenship of Iraqi Jews. Now, the question that comes to my mind is whether the Jewish education that was successful in creating a cultural elite and managed in acquiring lucrative employment and material success for its community could that have influenced some local Muslim populations to turn sour? Could that have bred envy and spite? Had the economy, economy created a class society? A class of society with a big divide? Causing bitter resentment by the general population. This question is often ignored, and the whole narrative is normally in, explained in terms of Arab nationalism and state oppression on one side, on one part, and Zionist propaganda on the other. 
both of which certainly played some part. But were these the real factors that fueled the anti-Jewish feelings leading to their expulsion? Can it be? Can it be that the Jewish education and the achievements it, trans it inspired was in fact not a blessing, but a curse? I'll leave you with this thought. Thank you for listening.